uh, the, the button. He wants the button. I just need to fiddle a bit first. So, wow, there's so many people here still. I'm really impressed. Um, yeah, thank you for being here and thank you for inviting me. And Kanta, I know you can't hear me because you're on a plane, but thank you for bringing me here. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the machine as alien ethnographer. Um, that's, I was thinking about my, the work that I do. I'm, I'm, I have a technical background, but I'm a working artist now and using technology in my work. And it seemed that machine as alien ethnographer seemed to kind of speak about what I tend to do. So I originally, I was working in the intelligent systems group at University College London, which is when I met Cantor. She was doing, we were both working on genetic algorithms at the time. And then I got more involved in the machine vision side of things. And then I spent quite a few years working on 3D imaging uh, of the human body and then set up, worked in commercial R&D and then set up a, a company to do that. And then after some time when we sold that company, I suddenly thought, actually, there's this whole other side that I want to explore and I decided to study fine art, which I did at Central St. Martins in London, and then more recently at Goldsmiths College in London. And since then I've been working as an artist all around the world, mostly festivals and um, some work in, in kind of white cube galleries, but mostly out and about in quite unusual locations. So, that's enough of me. Um, what I wanted to start with is, you might recognize this. It's an excerpt from um, an ancient encyclopedia called the Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge in which it's declared that animals can be categorized into exactly 14 categories. So those that belong to the emperor, those that are embalmed, tame, suckling pigs, mermaids or sirens, fabulous stray dogs, and this one I really like, included in the present classification, frenzied, innumerable, drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc. Um, having just broken the water jug, and finally, ones that from a long way off look like flies. So... <laughs> um, so if you recognize that, the, the, it, it may be because it's from a, an essay by the Argentinian writer Borges, and if you haven't read anything by him, then you must, because he's absolutely brilliant. Some of them are um, just half a page long, and in that half a page, he can set your mind off on amazing journeys. Another place you might have seen it is in uh, Michel Foucault, the philosopher, in his book, The Order of Things. He talks about this, not because it's amazing and absurd, but he says that the, this short passage shatters our usual way of thinking. And, and it, in this amazing exotic taxonomy that, that Borges presents, it's not just the charm of that alien taxonomy is actually that it suddenly makes us realize about the limitations of our own thought. And so that's kind of the background behind what drives most of my work. This idea of, of thinking kind of trying to, trying to think outside of usual ways of thought. And there, there's a, quite a big 
philosophical movement in the last 10 years or so, which has got various titles of anthro ant I can't say this <laughs> anti anthropocentrism or the post human or, or the non human. And um, it, it's generally, these schools of thought are about taking the human from the center of thinking and, and reconsidering what it is to be human. Um, some of it is technologically driven. So the idea of, of trying to remove this idea of rigid boundary between human and machine, or generally the, the tools that we use, and we're not just human, and then the machine is this other thing. We, we have an extended self that makes use of those things, even some technology as simple as a pencil. Um, or the more sophisticated technologies, which actually I meant to set my timer, you know, this, this technology that is an extension of ourselves too. Um, and they, so this is breaking the idea of breaking down barriers, not just in human machine, but also all sorts of categories that get projected onto us, like gender and sexuality and ethnicity and all those things. So trying to think outside of those boundaries and what it might be to move those. Um, also thinking about the agency of objects, so not just human as the only thing having agency, but um, machines having their own agency and, and even objects like this having its own agency. So um, this is obviously in anything, you're always applying some kind of assumptions and biases, but it's kind of shifting those assumptions and biases in, in different ways and, and seeing what emerges. So finally, some of my work, this is a, just a little example of it. This is a commission that I had um, in 20, 13, there's a, a, an organization called Secret Cinema in, in Britain, and they, um, they choose a kind of a, usually a, quite a cult film, and then they um, stage this incredibly uh, deep, <laughs> intensive, Im immersive experience that you, you sign up to this, you don't know what the the thing is going to be or where it's going to be and then at the very last minute you you're told of the secret location that it's going to be so they invited me to do this thing for the film brazil and i hadn't ever seen the film brazil and they said great uh, we don't want you to just be too much following the film but these are the themes that we want you to think about so i made this this thing with these giant eyeballs uh, so this was projected enormous, enormously um, with this giant tank of, of, of giant eyeballs that kind of bobbed around and then they, they follow, the, um, follow the people around and they bounce off each other and kind of you can see their pupils dilating and so on. Um, so, the, oh, sorry. The, so the idea of that was really thinking about, um, so the, these alien objects are kind of looking out at you and try as if they're sort of wanting to interact somehow. Uh, this was also at the Era 415 Awards in, in San Francisco and there it was projected like about 12 meters wide on, on the side of a building, which was great fun for me. So back to this idea of the machine as, as alien ethnographer. So my work tends to be, it's about a non-human entity exploring the human world, attempting to, to, to provoke you as an audience member to play. Um, and also uh, it's about the machine creating on its own terms. So if that's possible, the idea that a machine might be creating things that are not uh, controlled by by a human and, and if a machine might have its own aesthetic so 
Uh, we don't, don't, not quite even sure if that's possible, but it's interesting to think about it. So in doing that, I think I've found computation as an artistic tool has its very particular thing that, that you don't have with other art media, is that in computation you can do pretty much any kind of transformation that you want to do. And then uh, by, because the machine is basically just manipulating a symbol which you can interpret in any way, that automatically makes it possible for things like synesthesia, so you're taking data from one domain and transforming it into a completely different one. So it's quite, it's just incredibly exciting. It's such a rich area that there seem to be no limits on it. Um, so the, 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 the tools that I'm using in this, um, so mostly open source stuff. I work a lot with open frameworks C++ and increasingly with Python because Python's brilliant for natural language processing um, and I use a lot of open data sources and um, lots of, so I was going to do a demo but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to do that today but normally I'll be using a lot of um, sensors and actuators as well in the work. And also, um, because I don't want it to be just about machines, there's also or, or kind of blurring the boundary between a machine and, and the rest of the world. I also bring in quite a lot of organic stuff, so even rotting organic matter and, and so on. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in slick. Um, I'm going to quickly hop through these ones because I don't think there's too much time. I'm going to hop through to some more recent stuff. Yeah, so one of the other things I'm interested in is in the kind of the discourses around AI and in, in the, like popular conceptions of it and also how the media treat it. This was a piece of work I did two years ago because I'd been looking at media output about AI and I realized there were so many stories um, that were hyping it and trying to instill all sorts of fear into everybody. And there seemed to be kind of five different categories of the way that the media would report about AI. So uh, eventually, so I, kept, I was collecting these headlines together and I decided to make a piece of work about it. And, and the, the, the categories seem to be, um, number one, will a robot take my job? Number two, would you have sex with a robot? Number three, it was about AI ethics. Um, and number four, was, it seemed to be about kind of how AI would relate to the rest of the living world. In, um, so I saw that there was, at the time, that the Dutch police had been training bald eagles to, um, to take down illegal drones. And the, uh, and the final category, there was a, a, an, uh, an article in IEEE Spectrum about what Alan Turing really thought about AI. So I, I collected these together and, and decided to build uh, five little robots that would each act, be an actor and act out one of these headlines. So this was, uh, this was a, a show that I was involved in called Technology is Not Neutral. With these, so the, these are the five little robots that are moving around. So I programmed, e designed and programmed each of them with uh, different, various different capabilities to kind of try to embody those, those headlines. So there's uh, this one here is the Google AI, sorry, I need to go back to remind myself what the headlines were. The, um, yeah, so this is a, an article in the, the UK's Daily Mail called Google AI Ethics Board Remains a Mystery. And um, so the, the, the kind of the little policeman there is representing the, the Google AI Ethics Board. Uh, on the right, it, would you have sex with a robot? It was this, this little um, 
thing that it had a, a sort of touch, a capacitive touch sensor shell so that if you stroked it, it would emit kind of cooing sounds. Um, the second from the right is, was, is a, actually, it's hard to see in this light, but it's kind of piled up with hundreds of tiny little figures of people. That's the, will a robot take my job? And in fact, on the BBC online, you could actually type in stuff about your job and it, it would give you a percentage likelihood that your job would be taken over by a robot. And mine was luckily quite low, which was only 4%. Uh, and then, so there's, in the middle, there's the, the, the trained bald eagle uh, taking down a drone. And then on the, far, on the left here is, is Alan Turing. So they would interact with each other, sort of follow each other, and have um, confrontations. And in the end, actually, they, they, they were running for three months, and they ended up being quite... I kept having to go and repair them because they got quite battered. Um, and, and children quite like to grab and, and pick them up as well, which was fine. It's one of the hazards of doing public, public artwork. So this is one I'm going to go into in quite a bit more detail. This is a work that I've been, um, ongoing work uh, that I've been doing for the last year and a bit. And um, the idea is that there's this machine that has built itself from all sorts of discarded parts. And it's then trying to explore the world in which it's found itself. So it's, with its camera, it's looking around and it's tasting what it sees in the world. And then in response to that, it, it writes poetry. So there's a, um, uh, is, is projecting its poetry down onto the floor. And those taste meters are showing the different uh, taste levels of what it's, what it's seeing. So I trained um, a neural network to associate, I, I trained it on, with video clips of, um, it's all based around this idea of, of, of something generating itself from uh, rubbish or discarded things. So I trained the neural network on, um, rubbish heaps, compost heaps, rot rotting and discarded things with, I, I, so I assigned different taste values to the different types of, 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 of rotting stuff. And then based on those values, so there's salty, bitter, sweet, sour and umami, it takes those values and, and uses those as input to, to choose what words it's going to use when it's writing the poetry. So in this version, I used a, I used a genetic algorithm for the poetry, but um, I've been working on using Markov models now, which actually works. It makes slightly more human intelligible poetry than the, the gen genetic algorithm was doing. So it projects the poetry onto the floor and it also has a, um, a little thermal printer for, for printing it out too. And now I'm going to see, right, it should be running here. Yeah. So that's what it's seeing at the moment. And, oh. Yeah, so you can see the, this is, so this is the output values from the neural network up there. And at the moment, it's, you're, you're quite sweet and quite umami. So that the number two, so top one is salty, then sweet, then bitter, then sour, and then umami. And, mm, it's interesting, yeah. The left and the right side are slightly different. 
And then the, on the right here, I have to say, I can't, I, I, I'm sometimes when I see what it's writing, I'm quite embarrassed. But it seems to be safely not too, um, <laughs> there are some words in here that, that, that it, so I've, I fed various different books into it and, and some of the vocabulary is a little bit risque, but at the moment it's not, that tends to be the salty word. So actually at the moment salty is quite low and so it's not too sexually explicit. So I'll go in a little bit more detail about, about how I built that. Oh, that's another version of it. We actually we built it in a, in a big warehouse and we invited people to bring in old bits of technology and we built this enormous heap. So the heap was about that high and about four meters long, um, old, all, all sorts of ancient um, computers and junk. Um, there were some Commodores that, and at the end uh, we invited people to come. They could take stuff off the heap and take it home if they wanted to. Everybody wanted these old Commodores, and, but actually they weren't, they weren't available because the person who donated them wanted them back. But people, lots of people were coming in and looking at all the stuff in this heap and saying, wow, I used to have one of those phones. And they were really enjoying just looking at the junk in the, in the heap. So this is the kind of general structure of, of this machine, and it's, it's based quite a lot on um, Daniel Dennett's view of, of the human consciousness. So this idea that, that there are, um, there's no centralized control of, over the thinking, um, and there are these greedy processes that are seeking input and producing their output without, without an overall controlling structure. So in this example, so I have various ways that the machine can take input and it processes it and stores those in internal states. And then there are these uh, processes that, that will ex express the machine's inner states based on, on the data that it's consuming and then, then feeding that to various output devices. So in this, in the various perception modes, these are some examples. So I'm taking uh, input from, from the webcam there, uh, compressing it, and then feeding it to the neural network, and that, which produces the taste values which are stored, and then uh, those are picked up and used it when it's expressing itself. And this is the, the structure, of how the Markov model that, that you've seen the output from is working. So I trained it on various text sources, uh, which then feed into the production process. So it's based on the probability in whatever the text inputs were. Um, it, the, when it's producing a new piece of output, the words that it chooses in the next step depends on the probability of what was fed in, in the source text. Um, I also make use of an extended vocabulary. So it, 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 depending on what the, what the current stimuli are, it will choose vocabulary from different uh, categories of data. So uh, the sweet words are chosen from one vocabulary set. Uh, salty, bitter, sour, and umami, and so on from, from different vocabulary sets. So the umami words are, are taken mostly from technical sources. So, for example, uh, programming in C++ by Paul Cherlian, some of the words from that, uh, those, those have gone into the umami vocabulary set. And, and I particularly like words like uh, that have meaning in normal usage, but also have very spe specific technical usage like void and member and 
private and overload and so on, which produces the kind of ambiguity of those produces quite interesting text. And I'm running out of time. So uh, just finish off. Uh, the, uh, where, where I produce these artworks is incredibly varied. Um, it, uh, sometimes I work in, in, in woodland and parkland, and, and that's just a nightmare in terms of trying to get this uh, equipment so uh, in, in, into these places with no power sources. Um, so I've had uh, connects and max up in trees and using enormous portable battery sources to try and get these things working. Um, and there are particular challenges in, all the, in various, using like working in a heritage property where you're not allowed to drill into walls or anything like that. It, it, each time is, is completely different. And so, yeah, I'm going to close here. So, um, generally, I'm working using art as a, as a, a kind of a tool for critically analyzing things and trying to see things from a different viewpoint. And being here this week, I realize as a consumer of open source stuff, I feel the kind of the need to put something back into that ecosystem. Um, not quite sure, uh, I mean, apart from doing bug reports and stuff like that. And yeah, the last thing I wanted to say was, was it's actually a, a quote from uh, an Italian philosopher who, she said that this idea of the, the thinking of, of the, the post-human, it's, an, op an, a, an opportunity to, to empower the pursuit, so this is a direct quote from her, to empower the pursuit of alternative schemes of thought, knowledge, and self-representation, to think critically and creatively, so to develop a more sustainable relationship with the planet and, and its other inhabitants. Um, I'll finish there, so thank you for listening. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing with us this morning. Do you, do you have the last slide that you can put up? All right, no big deal. Okay, so um, for those of you who, there are some people I know that are headed to the airport, uh, and if you're not going to join us for, for Demo Friday at noon, thank you for coming.